All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we get started, this is the most romantic It's All Goodman <laughs> podcast ever. We're kind of lying on top of each other right now. We're lying on top of each other in a secret location where we only have access to about half of the equipment we normally use. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive but, the sound quality. Right. But <laughs> we're damn determined to keep this going every week until the end of this damn series. So... We gots to do what we gots to do. We gots to do what we gots to do, so... Let's go ahead and watch this, and then Dave, you and I can cuddle up on the couch, <laughs> and we'll watch the show. Uncomfortably close right now. I can, I can feel your <laughs> breath. <laughs> your customers are gone and your store is on the rocks. Spread around the gas because it's time to torch the stock. They got you at the checkout, the cops say, whoa, who are you going to die when they lock you down? Oh, Saul, Saul, you better call Saul, he'll fight for your right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is It's All Good Man, the better and most romantic. <laughs> <laughs> better Call Saul podcast. I'm Brian, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Dave. Dave, how are you doing this fine, sensuous evening? <laughs> I'm feeling a little off today. It's like somebody stole my brain out of my secret hiding space underneath my upstairs sink. So, uh, that good. <laughs> that good. <laughs> All right, Dave and I also host the Nothing Important Podcast. You can hear that at www.nothingimportantpodcast.com. Uh, make sure that you check it out later this week. We actually have a really cool interview with uh, yes. some actual location scouts from Breaking Bad, and it's all good, man. That's right, the Fail Scouts. The Fail Scouts, an awesome podcast. A lot of awesome information was given in that, so make sure that you check out Nothing Important Podcast uh, a little bit later in the week. Mm -hmm. Also, well, look, we can catch up on that scene that we missed out on earlier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> our, our Comcast problems continue, <laughs> even here in the secret lair. <laughs> all right, Dave, so what did you think of tonight's episode? Tonight's episode did not start with a flashback. Oh, well, that's good. I'm sorry, that was a fact. Um, I that was a fact. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Uh, I think that some of our theories were disproven in this episode. Yeah. It was a lot of bouncing back and forth between scenes. Mm -hmm. A lot of half lit faces, as usual. Right. And um, <laughs> half lit faces. <laughs> Oh, this duality. <laughs> so much duality. It is almost like a Ross and Rachel will they or won't they with who the hell is going to be the Kettleman's lawyer this time. Indeed, indeed. It kind of went back It went back and forth. So I bet a little bit slower pace. Well, maybe not so much slower pace, but total different feel than last week's episode with uh, where it was all Mike. Yeah, I think the uh, the, the uh, change in directors they have from episode to episode is really apparent in this show. Because mm -hmm. every episode has a different feel, different colors, different vibe. Right. Different tone. Different right. Different pace. So we started off the episode, uh, Saul and Mike were sitting in the hallway of the courthouse. That's right. Yeah, and they were, um, well, kind of, well, it started off, they were just waiting to hear from the, the two police officers about their notebook. Yeah, well, they, uh, apparently the uh, one officer had sent threatening voicemails or was calling Mike with a threatening manner about said notebook. Mm -hmm. So then, on their way to meet him, they found the notebook sitting on the asphalt. What a great coincidence. <laughs> that is so glad that that worked out that way. <laughs> oh, oh, look, even the replay is freezing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, re I really like how they handle that, because how I thought it was going to go is, since, uh, since it's obvious that just about every cop involved is, is somehow... Involved? Yeah, somehow involved. <laughs> every cop involved is somehow, like, involved. Um I thought it was going to be more, I, I thought they were meeting in the courthouse more as a, uh, uh, well, before they talked about the phone calls, you know, mm -hmm. I, I thought they were meeting in the courthouse more as a, uh, you can't make a scene here kind of thing. Uh, like, like when you break up with a girlfriend, you do it in public. Yeah. You do it in public. So she can't cause a fucking scene mm -hmm. or right? a text message or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I, I just prefer never to talk to them again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that all depends on the girl. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's where I thought it was going. And then they talk about how there was angry voice messages left. And then that got me thinking, well, how, how are they going to get out of this? You know, uh, once again, I figured that they'd be like, yeah, well, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it here? Right. You know, and I, I thought that's how we were going to find out that they had some level of involvement where 
Mm. You know, maybe Mike and Saul were going to be like, uh, well, before you start bitching at me about spilling coffee on you and taking your little notebook, you need to check yourself because mm. I have blackmail on you. But that, that's not really how it happened at all. No, because my first thought was that they were there to talk about the notebook. Well, <laughs> I kind of I kind of went straight from Jump Street. Thought this is where they're being confronted about the notebook, mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't think Saul would give it up that easy. No, it, it was it was an I Jimmy, love uh, Jimmy wouldn't give it up that easy. I love how it was an absolute bullshit story, but one that's absolutely irrefutable. Well, right, yeah, prove it. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's it. That's all Jimmy's saying. Is prove it. Exactly. I have your notebook. I, I found it. Prove that I stole it. Yeah, I, I like the whole little dynamic between all the officers too. Um, because you have the young cop trying to make a name for himself, mm-hmm. and then you have uh, the the older cop and uh, Mike, who kind of know how the game is played. Right. And there there was a lot of empathy between the two of them. Yeah, and it, it, that discussion was kind of like, "Fuck the new guy, like he'll learn." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, he just doesn't quite know how this works yet. But you know, I, I guess you could call it a professional courtesy. But I liked how they they said a lot in that conversation without saying anything Mm -hmm. and it seemed like there was just a basic understanding like like hey i understand you did you know as a father to maddie i understand you did what you had to do Mm -hmm. and um you know and in return you know i really got across that mike understood why they were there and he's like hey you know at the same time i understand you have to do what you got to do too right and I do like how Mike Mike mentioned that he liked the new guy that was giving him a hard time. Yeah, because yeah. he probably sees a lot of himself in said new guy. Yeah. It's just he has to learn that some rocks you don't turn over. Ah, oh, nice, nice. Good good bring it up. Good bring up. Good bring up. <laughs> I'm also going to point out the fact, if anybody noticed, the wanted posters. Yeah. Uh, the faces on the wanted posters are actually members of the Breaking, not the uh, Better Call Saul crew. Oh, they are? I don't know, but somebody proved me wrong. Oh, <laughs> actually, you know what? So here's my question. So uh, later in the episode, we'll, we, you know, we'll obviously talk about this. But when Sal go, oh, Saul goes into the bathroom mm-hmm. and talks on the phone and the guy taking a piss bumps into him, mm-hmm. that looked an awful lot like uh, like the mug shot they really held on before it scrolled down to Mike and, and Saul. You did say that during the airing of the episode, and I didn't hear what you said. So, I so I'm, I'm going to go with it. I'm going to go with uh, the guy in the bathroom taking the piss that bumps into Saul when he's on the phone was uh, the big, heavy bearded guy in the poster, and he's going to come into play before the end of the series. It did linger on that mug shot, and I was I was wondering what's that going to be about. Yeah, it, it felt. Hey, watch this! You know, it had that vibe to the shot, just like right. Notice, it, notice it, this Easter egg, like just just a little bit longer, right? Yeah. Like. So I, 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 I'm thinking, what, there's, uh, this was episode seven, mm-hmm. so there's eight, nine, and ten. So there's three full episodes after this, and I, I think that guy's going to come into play somehow. I like it. That's my, that's my prediction. I'm going to approve of that prediction. That is what I am going with. Well, then, I'm going to second that emotion. <laughs> <laughs> and move on to the next scene. Okay, so then they go to the parking lot. Yeah, the show it, opens up after the credits, which was uh, it was like a foot massage machine. Yeah, it was a foot massager. A very, uh, very enticing foot massager, especially yeah. for our super romantic podcast we got going on right now. <laughs> I just don't get. <laughs> I don't get what it has to do with the show. Well, because they they were weren't they doing pedicures? Who was? Saul and Kim, they were getting pedicures done, so maybe maybe that's just like showing three that, episodes ago. Yeah, but maybe that's just a callback to you know the okay. whole salon thing, you know, like where you can go in and get pampered. Maybe I was trying to think of some like massage. Dogs are barking. Weary. Long traveled road. I don't know because Jimmy did get kind of frustrated with some of the circumstances in this episode. Yeah, or just an old people reference because old people love to get their feet massaged. Ah, uh, oh, nice. You know, for the corns. <laughs> <laughs> I have my corns hurt. <laughs> the dogs are barking. Yeah, so no, nothing. Um, I, I still, I'm still kind of in love with like how lo-fi that is, though. Yeah, it's a good. I like it. Yeah. So, so we open up on the parking lot where Mike fires Jimmy. Yeah. It says your services are no longer required. Mm-hmm. Which seems to be a theme of the episode. Yeah, that's that's uh, the first of a couple firings. Yeah. As far as lawyers go. A couple of refires and rehires and yeah. Well, there was like turnover, like a dollar tree, dollar tree warehouse. <laughs> this is the, this is the most this is the most romantic. This is the romantic, most romantic. 
<laughs> you are literally cuddling on the couch to do this right now. We're going to bed. See, most romantic it's all good man ever. <laughs> this could have been our Valentine's Day special, Dave. Instead, it's our St. Paddy's Day special. <laughs> Yeah, this is going to go up on St. Paddy's Day, too. Remember that time Dave forgot a microphone and a charger for his computer? And I forgot my computer charger, too. So then your wife left the room. Right. <laughs> after after making fun of us <laughs> for snuggling. Smash cut to the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're what the hell has this podcast become? Seriously? <laughs> like, we started with such great intentions. <laughs> We're like Jimmy McGill, man. The best of intentions just turns to dog shit. Right. All right. So it, it goes to the parking lot, and uh, Saul is trying to get out of Mike what was said between him and the, right. the older police officer. He wants to protect himself. Mm -hmm. Mike is maintaining uh, Jimmy's plausible deniability mm -hmm. by keeping him out of the loop, and he says, you're safe. Don't right. worry about it. I got this. Jimmy says, you're going to represent yourself, and Mike's like, you don't really answer that, right? Then you just say you're not needed? Like, because Mike's kind of like, this isn't really going to go to court? Well, yeah. Well, and then Jimmy was like, well, you know, what about me? You know, I need to know what was said. And he's just like, hey, you're safe. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it. Your services are no longer needed. Right. So lawyer termination number one. <laughs> we keep a tracker. Yep. Okay. Lawyer number one. Number, lawyer termination number one. Uh, then it goes to commercial, and we're back at Chuck's house, where uh, Chuck's exposing himself. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> two electromagnetic fields. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought it was funny how he knows exactly what and what transformer it is and where it's located to his house, so he knows exactly where to stand. Right to help him. Raise his tolerance. Well, and you know what's funny? He he said to Saul, he's like, as you know, this transformer of this type is exactly this far of distance away. Mm -hmm. I wonder if he made Jimmy actually go measure the distance oh, yeah, from his house. He can't he do it. Like, yeah, yeah. As you know, <laughs> it's it's way, you know two hundred meters that way. But it, it's nice because it it shows. Um, so maybe before the end of the season, maybe maybe old old Chuck is going to make a dramatic. Yeah. Appearance. I mean, he's already up to five, no, two minutes. Two minutes, 120 seconds. And his goal was, what, five minutes in a week? Mm-hmm, yeah. Or by next week, he'll be up to five minutes. So by next episode, he should be up to five minutes. But he's all excited about the future, and he's ready to get out, and he's ready to deal with his condition. Right, and, he, and he, he says it's because of everything that transpired. With the cops. Last, well, last week when he was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So, like, retribution, man, because remember... Saul was all worried that he fucked he fucked everything up and he put him in the hospital. But no, but like he might have actually like pushed him past his. Yeah. Uh, it's like a rude awakening. Right? Yeah. Like you know maybe that that was what Chuck needed. Yeah. Like you know just uh, just some crazy ass shit to happen and get his ass taste. You know because maybe he's looking at it like this too. Like hey you know like I'm allergic to all this electricity and stuff, but I I survived getting tased where right. I'm like electrocuted directly. Yeah. Like I survived. So he thinks there's a chance that he can beat this thing, right? which is all in his head. Well. But whatever you need to get by, you know, whatever you need to tell yourself to get by sometimes. Yeah. You know, getting over the hurdle. Right. I like that scene. I thought that was really, I, I you know, <laughs> I really like how, how proud um, Jimmy was. Yeah, how proud. He's like, well, that's great, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> you don't sound like such a crazy fucker anymore. Well, maybe he was a little relieved, too, because. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, he didn't completely screw him over last week. Because, uh, you know, all the right, craziness. Right, yeah, all that, the guilty conscience thing. Yeah, you know, maybe he's feeling it too. Be like, you know what? All right, like, blessing in disguise. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, showing him that that he can he can beat this. So on his way out, he leaves his case files. Yeah, and as that was happening, we were kind of debating between us why he was actually doing that. Right. Right, whether it was, like, legit, he needed a holdover space. Because we had already seen the preview where um, he was going to move into... A bigger, bigger office, with right? More suites. So his excuse was that his office is getting full, right? He needed a place to store. He was sleeping on top of them, and right? Yeah. So then you said. So then I said he left the files there just so Chuck will take a look at them, accidentally or whatever, and uh, see the legitimacy behind Elder Law, right? Jimmy's yeah. excursion into Elder Law. So you think that was like a kind of like a. 
like a passive aggressive way for for Jimmy to be like Hey, big brother! Look, I told you I'm doing good. Or do you? Or do you think that Saul has some other grander scheme to where that's going to come come into play later? Because we've already seen it a few t- times now. Uh, old slipping Jimmy's like right. excellent at scheming and playing the long game, right? I thought it was. Um, I have all this money, and he's getting a new place, so he's just kind of backing it up. So oh, like, like, like legitimizing the fact that he even has the business. Oh yeah, so it wasn't like, a bribe like, hey, that's paying for rah, it. Really. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so it's like, look, man, I got all this money in mm-hmm. a new suite, and it's because elder law, elder law, all these files, and here's the files. To prove but we it. did. But the one thing I did say, I'm like, Chuck's gonna go through that. Mm-hmm. You didn't know, it. yeah. So then it, it could still all come crashing down. Mm-hmm. Because if if Chuck's that astute. He might see something in it that doesn't make sense. Like how he correct. Wait, who said the four thirteen? Yeah, Jimmy said four thirteen, and Chuck was like, "You mean five thirteen? Like he knows, right? Yeah, what is what when it comes to elder law? So he'll be able to point out if it's so. That's some good foreshadowing yeah, it's there. It's yeah. uh, you know, Jimmy's trying to. I think they're legitimate case files, though. I just don't think it's like excess. It's like all of his case files. He he brought there. He doesn't really have any in his office anymore. I think but Chuck thinks it's an overflow. But I mean, it was like three. I think I think what it is, maybe they're legitimate case files. Mm-hmm. They're just not his case files. Maybe they're just like public record shit. That, that, <laughs> that would he, be awesome. It's like Wade <laughs> versus Roe versus Wade. Right. So like maybe <laughs> maybe he just goes and like, like maybe he just went and collected these knowing that like Chuck will look through them. So he's like, yeah, they're legit. But then maybe it'll come back that because Chuck's so smart. He'll be like, uh. Hey, asshole, like, this happened, like, at this date, which is way before <laughs> when you started doing law. Maybe. A lot of different ways to go from that. Yeah. All right, so that, that's that's my prediction, is that they're actually public records that he printed off to stack the deck to make it look legitimate. Okay. And then Chuck catches on that those were actually not his cases at all. My prediction is that they are the actual cases Jimmy's been working on. It's just not extra, like, there's no room for him. He just left them there for Chuck to see. Chuck sees it, and we move on and never hear about these cases again. <laughs> Point, counterpoint. That's not bad. Smash cut to the office building. <laughs> <laughs> Room 801, eighth floor. Mm-hmm. Corner office. Yeah. Nice place. Nice place, indeed. I forgot to look up what a Coca Bolo desk was, though. I bet it's fancy as shit. I'll bet it's trashy. Well, even even Jimmy doesn't know because he just likes saying Coca Bolo. Right. But that's pretty. Uh, I think we both called that a mile away, though. As soon as he said that there was another office, and it was a nice bigger corner office. That it was for Kim. Kim. I think I think we both were like. I, I think that was very telegraph. Where, uh, you know, he's gonna offer her. Uh yeah, Coca Bolo furniture is uh, like thousands of dollars. Nice. So yes. Yeah. Fancy schmancy. So it was, it was just all big because he, he mentioned before that she should get away from mm-hmm. Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill. Right. And like, this was like his big grand gesture. Yeah. This like, was, hey, look, look at this awesome space we're building out. Look at my tiny office, this corner office. This this could be yours. Right. You can be a partner now. Yeah. Instead of waiting two years. Two years. But that's before shit went down, man. Right. But we haven't got to that part of the episode yet. We have not got to that part of the episode <laughs> yet. <laughs> but she kindly rejects him, just like any other friend zoned individual would mm-hmm. experience. Yeah. I, li- I like how. Um, and he just kind of. I-, I like their whole dynamic. It's, yeah. It- it's. Uh, man, I don't even know if it's friends with benefits, but well, I don't know. It's kind of with the robot sex thing from a I'll few say, episodes yeah, ago. They're, they're a cyber banging. Cyber banging. <laughs> ASL. <laughs> 34M, Illinois. <laughs> and we're back to the Kettleman's. That's right. We're back to the Kettleman's little consultation. Oh, my God. With Kim Wexler. Betsy Kettleman is probably one of the worst people on the face of the planet. I agree. It's like she has she has so much to prove, as she always has to be. She cannot be wrong. She cannot be wrong. She cannot face reality. And she keeps doing, like, mental gymnastics, like... Right. She's playing the victim. Mm-hmm. She's... I didn't do anything wrong. This is our money, which is not. Right. I like how she's indirectly, or even directly, admitted that they're guilty, but still holds, too, that there, there's no money, and they're not guilty. Right. You think at some point she'd just give it up and be like, okay, yeah, look, I'm guilty as shit, but um, I'm not taking any deal. We're, we're taking this shit to court. Right. It's that fake confidence where you can't show a crack in the weakness or can bring your whole case mm-hmm. down. So you just have to maintain. You have to clutch it like a cornerstone. Mm-hmm. 
until it all comes down. I was quoting a tool song there. Nice. Wait. So the deal, the deal that Kim got for the Kettleman. I have here in my notes. I wrote down the Kettlemans are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely proven because she she got him a great deal. Comparatively, she's like, dude, you're looking at yeah. thirty years, in a, <laughs> thirty years in jail, thirty years in jail. You won't win with the jury, right? So here's sixteen months, right? And give the money back, and give the money back. That's all you gotta do, homie. That's it. That's it. But Betsy isn't having it, man. <laughs> Betsy straight fired her ass, right? <laughs> Which <laughs> is lawyer termination number, number two. two. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, Betsy Kettleman. She's so cute. Oh, my God. It's the beautiful ones that hurt you the worst. Ah. Oh. <laughs> you know what? And um, I, I thought it was funny after that how they, when they walked out that, like, Howard was really trying to get him back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was chasing, He was trying to keep that client. Right. But, that client. but, I mean, the only thing he could benefit from that, I guess, was his share of the $1.6 million that they're hiding to pay for the law. The the uh, legal representation. No. Well, what, just, what else does he have to gain? Oh, legal fees. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's like, where are they going to get the money for legal but, fees? But oh, the one point six million dollars that he stole. That a uh, portion of that is going to go back to Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill. No, the one point six is going to go to the state, and then they're going to have to cover their, pay for legal fees after that. Mm, yeah. But you see what I'm saying? Like. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's just after his legal fees. Right. This is a big case. Yeah, I guess that's true. So maybe yeah. for him, it's kind of like a name maker too, even though they're kind of. Well, it's high profile, and it's just, it's just. I just took it as losing a client. Like that's what lawyers are gonna do mm -hmm. if they feel like they're losing a client. You know, they're just gonna try and keep you as a client. Right, but then he ends up punishing Kim over right that. because he tries. You know, that's why he was trying so hard because he knew he was gonna have to punish Kim. Yeah, moved her to the cornfield. Moved her to the cornfield. I wonder if that refers to the view or if that's some sort of legal. Like uh, I assumed the, it was the view. Yeah. Well, like the backside of the building. Yeah, he's like, it's not a cornfield. And he's like, well, that's what you call it. So I wonder if that was some sort of legal ease, yeah. like in the industry, like industry speak, like what 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 does the cornfield mean to a lawyer? Yeah, maybe it's like the rows of desks or something. Oh, that's good. A bunch of bunch of lawyers that are just gonna get turned over and harvested anyway. Oh, look at you. Nice. That's a, that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I was going to say edit out that whole conversation, but you kind of brought it back and made it <laughs> relevant. Okay. They send Kim to the cornfield and uh, punish her. Then, then she says it looks like her two-year plan just became a 10-year plan. That's so best. not out. But well, that was the best-case scenario. Yeah, best-case scenario. So it's definitely a setback. Career adjustment necessary. Right, and we, we thought that that was going to be the moment where she just jumped ship then. Yeah, we thought she would go to Saul, partner up, take yeah. the corner office. Yeah, it's time to do this. No. But then but then she kind of went with him anyway because, as he, we found out later, they the Kettlemans go to him, so then it would have screwed him over in the long run. Right. But I guess that's unbeknownst to the characters, but that would have been an interesting mm -hmm. interesting plot point where she goes works for Saul, and then it screws over Saul because... <laughs> because <laughs> the Kettlemans don't want to work with Kim. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. I did like the scene where Saul was hosting Bingo. Bingo, that's right. Irene, Irene, big winner. Yeah, Irene. Congratulations, Her Irene. Cats, uh, Oscar and Felix. Yeah. Hilarious. Felix the cat's great cartoon. Felix uh, washes himself. Oscar doesn't. <laughs> I was wondering what she was saying. That's what she was talking about. She was talking about her cats. <laughs> Old lady conversations. I love I love how the grand prize was just a really cute notebook with a cat hanging on it. Was like, it? I didn't it was even just, see what the prize was. Oh, it was just was. a picture of a fluffy cat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's when that's when Jimmy gets the call from the Kettlemans because they want to meet with him to discuss legal representation. Right. And then he kind of steps out for a bit, but... And then he puts down his Bob Barker mic. <laughs> yeah, like complete with requisite microphone feedback. And can we please, side note, put a stop to every time somebody touches a microphone, it feeds back. Mm -hmm. That's not how microphones work. <laughs> <laughs> Just like every time a gun moves, you don't need to hear it click. <laughs> yeah. No moving parts, you don't need sounds. Right. Stupid audio people. Dave got really offended during that part of the show. Hating on my own kind right now. Word. <laughs> <laughs> someday I will be asked to put a stupid sound effect in like that. <sighs> so long story short, 
not every microphone gives feedback when it's dropped or fire touched. that engineer because <laughs> microphones aren't supposed to feedback. So smash cut to the diner, <laughs> which I think it was the same table. And this is where I started to notice. I think we were seeing some like repeating scenes from earlier episodes or like, even like a similar order of scenes. If anybody wants to look at, into that and get back to us, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I, I don't know like how the same table as the first meeting with the Kettleman's. Yeah, I you know what I I didn't really pick up on that, but like you said that throughout the whole episode that a lot of it seemed early familiar. Yeah, and and you believe that a lot of it was like very similar shots from the first time we met the characters. Yeah, so like it was like, like callbacks to, going from this scene to this scene, going from from like Chuck's to H H M or whatever. Yeah, from this location to that location in order. Mm-hmm. Definitely not completely con- continuous, but I took note of it. So he's talking to the Kettlemans. They're still maintaining your, their innocence. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy's like, uh, dude, don't you, don't you remember the tent? <laughs> we had yeah. a tug of war. We had a tug of war match over, over the bag. money that doesn't exist. Right, yeah. So like, it was basically like, okay, can we cut the shit? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like, seriously, let's, let's just cut the shit. And, but that's where the whole Betsy's, there is no money, there is no money. Because there has to be all of the money. If there's one dollar, there's one point six million dollars, mm-hmm. and Jimmy's got thirty grand of it. Yeah, it's his retainer. His retainer. Yes, they kind of blackmail him into taking the job. Yeah, checkmate. Whoo, there's a lot of blackmail going on. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's hands are dirty. Checkmate. And then, but remember, then when they were trying to uh, convince him to take the case, that's when he went to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Got bumped by the big guy. That you think is going to come into the show later. Right, because I think he was the guy from the poster that they lingered on in the courthouse at the beginning of the episode. Right. Where where Jimmy refers to the Kettlemans, mm-hmm. Ned and Maud Flanders. Ned and Maud Flanders. Which I love. Yeah. That's a good, because it, it's an astute comparison, and we're huge <laughs> Simpsons geeks. So, absolutely. Very Maud Flanders-ish without the churchy stuff. So, we couldn't even figure out what Elder Law was. So Ned says something to the effect of, well, maybe if we were old, he'd represent us. <laughs> like, he only represents old people. And oh, not- yeah. I like how it was being explained. And she's like, he gets it. Like, remember, <laughs> remember they, were talking about, they were talking about the bribe? And then she kept calling her a retainer. Oh, yeah. And he's like, I think he's, she's referring to the bribe. She's like, he yeah. gets it. He gets it. Man, what a bitch that guy is. That guy is such a Sally. But he's a hardened criminal now. Yeah. You think he'd have a little bit of street cred, right? No, apparently because no. they said he did a really sloppy job, and yeah, it yeah. totally makes sense. Like yeah. he just he doesn't know how to commit a crime, leaves breadcrumbs all over right. the place. I, I believe he had reams of checks, yes, written by him to him to him for bogus expenses. For bogus expenses. Hey man, he's got the paper trail. Not exactly a master criminal, <laughs> but uh, before that, smash cut. Do 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 to H H M. Where it is confirmed Saul's taking over the case. Mm-hmm. And he's picking up the paperwork from right Howard, from Howard Hamlin. So much paperwork. And uh, this is where another thing. He goes out to the parking garage. Kim's up against the wall. He takes a cigarette from her mouth. Yeah. Takes a drag off of it. You know. Um, they get on the same page. What, what do you think the chances are of, of uh, Jimmy actually finding something in those boxes and boxes and boxes of paperwork that somehow exonerate the Kettleman's? Do you think he's going to get them off? I don't know. She was kind of de- she was kind of like demanding that that happened. Well, yeah, but she can demand all, want, all she wants to. Right. Because eventually he talked her into going back to HHM, right? Yeah. Well, because let, let's talk about that. So, um, Jimmy, that's when Jimmy kind of hashes um, hatches a scheme, right? Because he, he gets all the paperwork from HHM. So he's in his office going through the paperwork late at night. Mm-hmm. Looks up, sees the box of money hiding in the ceiling. Right. And then he hatches his scheme. He hatches his scheme. Which is? So he calls up Mike, who apparently he sent Mike the bill. That's is sending him the bill. Mike uh, sprays down the money with some sort of identification mm-hmm. liquid. Gives yep. the money back to the Kettlemans. Follows the uh, trail of fluorescent hotel checking light, whatever. I, I do like real quick how... Uh, from the time Mike showed up at their house to the time that they find the money, that was uh, five apples worth of time. 
That's right. It was five <laughs> apples worth of time. So he's good for keeping the doctor away for five days. Five days. Which we see in the next episode. He goes to the doctor. Wait, which he'll need it because, <laughs> uh, because he's elderly. <laughs> he's he's got geezer. a bullet in his chest. Though. Right, yeah. Um. So, yeah, so he... he Uses that little scheme to find out where they're keeping their money. What, what I love about that, though, uh, first off, it was just like the crazy, like, jazz, like, music. Like, mm-hmm. not not a word was said. But I love the fact that the, the Kettlemans were yelling at their children because the money was on the back of the... Oh, of, yeah, like he set the, the kids up? Yeah, he set the kids <laughs> up, and they, they were yelling at them yeah. <laughs> and sent them upstairs. And then that's when he broke in mm-hmm. and filed the money. And then he where do you find the money, Dave? In the uh, under the sink on the second floor. Mm-hmm. Who else hid stuff under the sink? Oh, I think there was a character in Breaking Bad that hid some stuff under a sink named Jesse Pinkman. Right. I guess if we're gonna hide something, that's the best place to do it. That or in a wall like Walter White. Mm. It's like Jesse Sinkman. Oh, and see. Walter White. Oh, oh, I get it because <laughs> it's the sink and the, the wall. And the wall. Yeah. Mm. <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike Airman Trout. So. See, living up to his badassery, man. Already. Living up to his badassery. And I'm thinking, since Mike brings the money back, mm-hmm. they add Saul's amount to it. So now Saul is in the clear and the money is complete once again. Mm-hmm. Well, they even said that. He's like, I'm assuming mm-hmm. after this. We're even, like we're, right. we're we're clear. I'm wondering if we're gonna get some sort of escalation of favors. I did you this favor. We're even. Well, not really. So you owe me this favor. Now we're even. Well, not really. And the favors just keep escalating. Right. Yeah. Like like no money is exchanged in hands because now it's already went back and forth a few times. Mm-hmm. But like, see, but th- the thing about that is, is they're building trust with each other. Mm-hmm. And that was apparent because remember Mike Mike came back with all the money mm-hmm. and Saul was like thanks for not yeah. running off to Bahamas or Bahamas anything. with it right mm-hmm. so like they're building trust with each other so even though one might not necessarily owe the other a favor they both kind of know what kind of people they are so and they both know that they can kind of trust each other even though it's not really apparent right now if Mike likes Jimmy or if they even like each other right right but but it's like hey you know I need something kind of quasi illegal done yeah or just flat out illegal done and i know you'll do it and you know that i won't sell you out on it right you know it's going to be under the table Mm -hmm. mum's the word right kind of a deal absolutely indeed indeed quite yes Mm, yes Mm. Mm. (laughs) so back to the kettlemans Mm -hmm. i didn't say smash cut that time yeah nice (laughs) And the only note I have here is criminals have no recourse. Yeah. So, um, so the next day, Saul ends up at the Kettleman's house under the guise of he's going to consult them about the case, mm-hmm. but lets them know that maybe they should check the money under the sink. Right. Go go make sure it's still there. Go, yeah, and it wasn't. It wasn't. Because Mike took it. Right. Brought it back. And then they brought it to... I'm assuming they took it to the HHM. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, a, like I took that as, like, it's an HHM's possession right now. Right. So, like, when... Uh, it's going such, back to the state. Right. Exactly. But then they come down and they, uh, for all intents and purposes, fire Jimmy, which is lawyer termination number three. Number three. But he also said, like, I quit. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll I'll count it. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's, uh, <clears throat> that's kind of a good running joke. The lawyer's getting fired. I like that. Yeah. I thought that funny. was kind of funny. But I also like how um, how you actually, it, it showed how desperate Jimmy really is in his life. Because desperate he, he just. To, to desperate for money and desperate to do the right thing. Well, yeah. Well, he, he just flat out said, he's like, the thing you need to know about me is I, I don't have anything to lose. Right. Yeah. He's got nothing to lose. Right. So, I mean, what are they going to do to him? And right. they already bribed him, which is illegal anyway. Right, yeah, they're saying they're going to go call the cops about uh, Jimmy stealing the money, and he's just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> right, like criminals have no recourse, <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, which, is also, no recourse. which is also what Nacho told him. Like, you know, hey, the best, the best person to steal from are criminals because mm-hmm. it's not like they can go to the police. Right. It all comes back, Dave. It all... Look at that. This whole show is just one big loopity loop. One big loopity loop. Mm. (laughs) So then he takes the Kettleman's to HHM. 
which is kind of weird. It's like the middle of the night. They're sitting in the parking garage in their car. He brings Kim outside to get him or whatever. Passes right. the case on. And then we go to Saul's digs. Nice, a nice little moment. Well, there was a nice little moment where Kim, I'll uh, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. The thank you for yeah. doing the right thing. I, I was totally waiting for, as the elevator doors were closing, I was totally waiting for uh, Mrs. Kettleman to, like, flip uh-huh. Saul off or just start screaming or break down and start crying. Yeah, no, because she already had the breakdown at the house when she finally realized that. <laughs> like, they just kind of came to grips like, with what was going to happen. My favorite phrase of all time, it is what it is. It is what it is. Because that is the most redundant, retarded <laughs> phrase anybody can say. But, yeah, it is what it is. At the end of the day, it, it is, is what it is. It, <laughs> <laughs> because it can't be anything else. <laughs> cannot be what you... Look, now we're in an ex- existential mm-hmm. freaking conversation here. So, and they, Well, you know what I was thinking, too? <laughs> like, they keep... They talk about... Uh, we were talking about, like, favors. Mm-hmm. But now Kimmo's... Tim owes Jimmy. Kim owes Jimmy. Robot sex voice. And like the se- and the seeds of discontent have already been planted in her as far as H. Uh, right. Hamlin, Hamlin McGill goes. Right. So maybe that'll come into play. So then they should wrap up the show with Jimmy lamenting the potential loss of mm. his new digs. Um, but then the phone rings. He has a tantrum or kicks the door. It's over. You looked at me and said, he lost everything. He did. He lost everything. Lost everything to for his freaking integrity, mm-hmm. being the do the right thing. Right. And then the phone rings. Yeah, I like how he had to compose himself to mm-hmm. do the uh, the British accent. And it was still kind of terrible. Like it was still kind of cracking. Good yeah. acting job there, Bob Odenkirk. So do you think do you think the phone call will come into play, or do you think I it was just like showing that like there's hope for him to get back on his feet? My first thought, honestly, completely honestly, that phone call. Is going to be the basis of the next episode, or it's going to be heavily involved in the next episode, and it's going to be an up thing. It's not going to be a bad phone call. It's going to be like some sort of new client mm. that's going to reignite things and gotcha. kind of get him out of his funk a little bit. Gotcha. I, I just kind of uh, took that as like a wink and a nod to the audience, like, hey, uh, everything's going to be all right because he bounces back. Yeah, it's kind like, of like I, I, I don't think it'll be like any better way of saying what I just said. Right. I, I don't think. I don't think it'll be anything specific to next episode. I just think it was like a, just like that little story arc, a good way to end it where like, mm. you know, like, you know, he takes, he, get, he gets a phone call because that's all he wanted at the beginning of the series was a phone call. True. He's always checking his messages. And now for better or for worse, he's actually put himself in a place to where he's getting mm-hmm. actual phone calls. I think it's important. Yeah. I think it's a big one. Yeah. So three more episodes to go, man. Three more episodes to go. And, uh. How are you liking the series so far? I'm enjoying the series. It's pretty slow. Um, See, I like that about that, though. But, yeah, I mean... I, it, it's, it's a deliberate pace. Because I've talked to people that feel like it's too slow. They don't like it as much as Breaking Bad. They feel it's moving a little too slow. But, I don't know, because they're exploring. Breaking Bad was slow as shit up until, like, the fourth season where... Yeah, that's true. Where, like... All of a sudden, Walter is like an action hero and well, blowing shit up. That's and why binge-watching affects things, because it feels a lot faster when you can watch five episodes. Right. You get five episodes worth of content in one day, where we get 42 minutes with commercials. Mm-hmm. You know, an hour yeah. and a half if you watch the replay of the other episode. Right. But uh, I'm entertained by the show. Very good. It's definitely well-acted and well-put-together. Yeah. And uh, I do like, I actually enjoy the fact that every show with a different director has its own kind of vibe Mm -hmm. to it. Um, It keeps it interesting. Totally. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm a fan of the the real deliberate pace, and I've actually kind of started to forget. Remember, I've mentioned a few times on the show, a few times how I always, you know, like spoilers and stuff don't bother me, or how knowing how something ends up doesn't bother me, because Mm -hmm. I always, like, think how did how did they get there right you know and like try to beat it to the punch mm-hmm. but with this show i've actually like in many respects forgotten about breaking bad yeah yeah you know i what really I mean? don't like, think about that like as i'm watching it like I've, I've totally forgotten about like breaking bad and the only time it pops into my head is when we turn on the microphones or in today's case microphone <laughs> <laughs> and all we and, need is one mic, dude. We're like, nah, it's word. <laughs> you know what I mean, though? We're Paul McCartney and John Lennon and this <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. I've totally at this point like forgotten about it, and I'm 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 actually like invested in the series. Yeah, I'm pretty invested in the series. It's, it's got me in. Like, I'm not I'm not forcing it to do this podcast. Right. <laughs> I was afraid of that. I was afraid I'd have to like force myself to enjoy the show. 
to do the podcast about it. But no, it's it's cool. And and that's what makes it so much easier, especially with like uh, the interaction we've been getting, mm-hmm. you know, from uh, from the listeners and such. Which again, thank you. Totally cool. Big totally ups, cool. big ups to the listeners. Big ups indeed. Without um, you, we'd still be here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and with that, folks, uh, uh, we're just going to go ahead and end the most romantic edition of It's All Good Men. Uh, please make sure to hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, It's All Good Men.com. Make sure to check out It's All Good Men on location. Our buddy uh, Travis down in uh, Albuquerque taking photos of the location. Please make sure to hit up the Toe Jam and Earl Kickstarter link that we have for an awesome guy with an awesome game. Make sure to go to Audible, get your free trial, download Bob Odenkirk's book, A Bunch of Hooey. Go get that for free. It would help out the podcast. It's free, and we get paid for it. Yeah. We will make literally dozens of dollars. And and if we ever start getting paid, we can put together a better podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And real quick, before we head out, I want to touch on it. Some people have talked about actually having a meetup in Chicago. Uh, That is actually something we've started planning. So please uh, make sure to turn in to uh, tune into preview with a prior Uh, this week. I'll have some more information about that. And before we go, I want to give a shout out to our buddy on Twitter, Brant, who last week gave Dave and I a hard time about whether Mike took or dropped something in the car. Right. And on the second watch, we definitely noticed he went pocket first as he's leaning into the car like he's about to plant something. Right. And Brant tweeted us and he was like, what the hell were you guys thinking? It's so obvious what was going on. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> we're dumb sometimes. You got us. And my response to Brant was, is I either had too many or too few beers. Right? Ha ha. That's funny. <laughs> so this week before the show tonight, Brant hits us up on <laughs> Twitter again and reminds us not to get drunk. <laughs> so, so I'll have you know, Brant, I haven't had one single drink tonight. But I'm still just a stupid. (laughs) All right, Dave. Oh, call us idiots, call us geniuses, whatever. Just call us. You heard me. You better call us.